Today we're making cheese. Um, I haven't done a cheese making video yet, mostly because um, I'm just learning and I don't know everything. Um, I am using a book called uh, The Art of Natural Cheese Making. Um, I'm loving this book. It um, doesn't use a lot of uh, additives. like uh, So you can buy cultures to culture your cheese with, but in this book it teaches you how to make your own kefir. So I make my own kefir and you use this culture, you strain out the grains, and you use this culture to culture your cheese. Instead of having to buy um, a culture you have to reuse, you, you, or I'm sorry, that you can't reuse, that you have to just use each time and then rebuy the culture. So this way, I bought kefir grains, but I keep the kefir going and I can make as much as I want so that I can use it in smoothies. And we also use it to make our ranch dressing. And um, so, Today we're gonna to make some cheese, partly because I have milk that needs to be strained and I'm out of jars. So we need to use up some milk so I can have the jars back to put the new milk in this morning. I need to do it quickly because that milk needs to get cold as quick as possible. Look at that cream line. Let's see, like right there. That's crazy. That's off, off our Jersey cow for comparison. This one is our Guernsey cow. The line is there. So it's actually, they're actually about the same uh, cream line. But one thing I've noticed is once you separate this cream off the Jersey cow, the milk is very um, thin. The milk is much thinner. When you separate off the cream from the Guernsey cow, the milk is still really thick and creamy. Um, it's really weird and interesting. So, we're gonna take a little bit of the cream off because um, we do want cream in our cheese. Like, if it was mozzarella, I'd take all the cream off that I could skim. Uh, but with, I think we're gonna make a tome cheese today, which is kind of like a Parmesan cheese. Um, I want cream in it, of course, but this milk is so creamy that I can take some off and it's, I'm not missing it in the final product. Okay, so I got almost a quart of cream off of just half gallon of Jersey and a half gallon of Guernsey milk. So almost a complete quart. I probably could have skimmed a little bit more, but I don't want to fill this up because I'm actually going to make butter. And um, the way that's been working for us the best lately is um, shaking it in a jar. You know, I don't know if you ever did this when you were a kid, but my mom would teach us to make butter. Um, she taught uh, preschool in her daycare and so as an older child you know I always helped with those things and she would put um, a little bit of cream in a baby food jar and have us shake it until it became butter and I always thought that was really cool so um, I've tried whipping it and it makes beautiful whipped cream but it never leaves the whipped cream stage if any of you know why that is like I can't figure out why it will never leave the whipped cream stage and get to the butter stage but as soon as you take the whipped cream and put it in a jar it turns right into butter like I mean, we have to shake it, but it's weird. So today I'm just gonna put it in the jar and shake it, and I'm hoping that's enough leeway. It might not be enough. I might have to separate it into two jars, but we'll see. So now I'm gonna take my um, milk, and I'm actually gonna shake it a little, because if you see, some of the cream sticks around the edge, and so um, I'm just gonna shake it up here a little bit and kind of get some of that cream off the edge before I pour it in my pot. Now remember, I only took cream off of two jars. They're each a half gallon jar. So the rest of the cream is going right into the cheese. So again, I shake it just because the cream sticks um, when it's been sitting. So I kind of get all the cream off the sides. So we don't want to waste it. Okay, 
so the first thing I do is turn on my stove. I find my thermometer. So we just stick that in on the side of the pot. And I like to use a wooden spoon for stirring. And um, you really don't want your temperature up very high. You really want maybe like a medium to medium high. Uh, you want it to heat slowly. I've made a few batches of cheese um, over the last year of owning a cow. And last year I made a few and they came out great. I decided to get serious about cheese making once we got this new cow. Now she didn't produce as much as I thought she was going to. We thought she would produce five gallons a day, but we realized we're probably not feeding her enough. <laughs> Somebody's crawling under my my uh, tripod. Um, we're probably not feeding her enough. I mean, she's surviving, but not enough to give her good, good enough nutrition uh, to make that much milk. So. We're okay with that for now. We are feeding hay. It's probably not the amount, it's probably the quality of hay. But anyway, that's a whole nother topic. Um, so I got serious about cheese making and I decided I would focus on one cheese a month. The first cheese I chose was a tome cheese because it's really easy for beginners. I have been making this cheese for a month and every time I get out the book and I read it, I don't try to go off memory because my memory often fails me, especially because I'm also making mozzarella every week for pizza. And um, one week I got confused. I ruined the mozzarella because I was thinking, I didn't look at the recipe and I started doing the tome cheese instead of the mozzarella. And so anyway, it turned out fine. We ate it. Um, it just wasn't the best mozzarella cheese. So I'm going to get to the Alpine cheeses section. And so we're going to do a tome cheese. Tome is... T-O-M-M-E and this is an alpine style cheese. You want to develop a, a white fungal coat. Now, what you do is you take the brine and you wash it after the cheese is done. And you do that every few days. And we'll get to that at the end. Um, mine develops a light white coating, but then I've decided to vacuum seal my cheeses because I don't have a proper cheese cave. And we've tried to build one and it just hasn't worked out. Um, too much moisture, too many bugs. Um, too far away where I can't monitor the cheese as well and they end up overgrown with mold. And even though you want mold, uh, you want certain types of mold. And uh, so I have decided to attempt vacuum sealing cheeses. I've only vacuum sealed two cheeses so far. I have one waiting to be vacuum sealed. I wash it until it gets a, a kind of a white scummy rind on it and it's a little bit dry and then I vacuum seal it. So we'll see how those turn out. I've had one going for I think it's four or five weeks old now and so I'm going to probably take it out and try it when it's six weeks old. It really probably needs like three to six months but okay so let's get on to the recipe. stove and we're gonna add our culture you can definitely buy a mesophilic culture online um, local cheese making shop sometimes I think you can buy them at like um, like brewery shops or you know wine and beer brewing um, shops but cheese making shops online is a great place to get it uh, this book teaches you how to make it and make a culture from kefir I am using cow kefir 
um, that I have made with kefir grains and I let them sit on my counter and I strain them out and then I have this nice thick product. We use it in smoothies, etc. Um, so this calls for one cup of kefir in a five gallon batch. Now I'm making a two and a half gallon batch because I do not have a big enough press to press a five gallon uh, cheese. <laughs> it's just really big. Um, maybe at some point I will get one or make one, but right now I don't have it. So I make two and a half gallons and so that would be about a half cup of kefir for this batch. So now we want to just stir that in and make sure it is incorporated through the whole batch. The instructions are to keep it at 90 degrees for an hour to incubate and let the culture culture all the milk. Um, but I find I don't have to keep relighting the stove uh, when I'm doing other cooking, like I'm gonna make lunch now. Uh, so we're gonna let this sit for an hour and then we'll be right back. firms up the fat and then you're getting all the extra whey out of the butter. It'll have a funny taste if you leave the whey in. And then I just, uh, I'll put both of them in here and we'll salt them here in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and add the rennet now. But I have a liquid rennet that I buy. This one is organic vegetable rennet and I get it from Cultures for Health. Um, I, I don't necessarily love it, uh, but I bought it because I was unsure of some of the animal ones and making sure, since we don't eat pork, I wanted to make sure it was definitely calf run it. Um, so I'm doing some research on that and I might start using that. Um, interesting, this book tells you all about how to make your own calf run it. And I know that turns some of you off completely, but if you're homesteading and being self-sustainable, um, it's a skill that I would love to learn someday. I'm not ready for it right now. Um, so I'll just buy it for now. But I think that um, having the knowledge um, is probably a good idea at some point. Um, so liquid vegetable rennet. Now, this is difficult to use because <laughs> it doesn't have an exact dosing. It says it's double strength rennet. Um, but so you use half the amount called for in your recipe. My recipes call for like... Um, like a tablet rennet. It's a calf rennet that comes in tablet form. So it's difficult to do the ratios. I believe this is a quarter teaspoon for one single regular dose. So I do two and a half gallons, so I half the recipe. The recipe calls for two regular strength calf rennet tablets dissolved in water. So I think so a single dose would be one tablet. That would be a quarter teaspoon of this. So I think I use a half a teaspoon, but it's kind of made up. So we're gonna put this in a half a cup of water and put it in. We put it in about half a cup of warm water so as not to change the temperature. And we stir it around really good up and down. And around and around and then we let it sit for another hour Sit with 
culture for an hour and then we let it sit with rennet for an hour. Now, we check for a clean break. So I usually just stick my finger in and separate and actually all the ways started to separate because I actually left it a little too long, but it just has pretty clean break in it. Cut the curd to the size of a lentil using a wire whisk, whisk the curd within an eighth of an inch of its life. So basically I just take this in here and I mix it around. I just use the whisk to break up the curd and I try to get all the way to the bottom to break up the curd in the bottom as well. While I'm stirring it, we're gonna turn on the pot and we want to get the um, temperature of the cheese up to 110. So I'm gonna get my thermometer back out here. The book also says you need to do this slowly. So we're gonna turn it down just a little bit. It's like medium high maybe. Um, and it says your hand is the best way to stir the cheese. So you know if it's good enough for the Italians, it's good enough for me. Um, since we are making a Parmesan style cheese here, but it's tome cheese, which is that style of cheese in Alpine style. So we're gonna stir it with our hand. It's warm. You wanna break up the curd and you wanna go all the way to the bottom. So I'm going to the bottom, making sure all that curd is broken up. Don't touch the bottom because it's hot. And you just wanna keep it stirring, mostly so that the cheese doesn't settle to the bottom and burn on the bottom because that would be bad. Okay, so we're just about at 110 degrees there. And you'll know, I mean, by the feel of it, 110 is where it gets uncomfortable to keep your hand in the water for very long. You can definitely keep it in there, but it's definitely getting hotter. Um, and then the other test they say is to let it drain for five seconds in your hand. And then if you can squeeze it together and it kind of knits together, then it's ready. So I break that up when I put it in because you don't want it to set up yet like that. So I go ahead and stir it. We're at 110 and we turn off the heat. Um, we turn off the heat and then we do what's called pitch the curds. And that just means let it sit and all the curds will kind of knit together and drop to the bottom of the pot and all the way will be at the top. And it says to do that for about five minutes and then we'll press the curd. This is my cheese press. I got it from homesteadersupply.com, not affiliated. This is the tome I made last week. This is two and a half gallons, um, but I've made it with three and it's just a little bit taller, you know, um, and that's in the larger one. I've made some like one gallon cheeses out of the, just the little form, but this is last week's cheese still drying on the counter. Um, I brush it down every other day or so when I remember with some salt brine, which we'll talk about here in a minute. We're going to take apart the cheese press here. And you can see all my messy counter because there's got a lot of stuff going on here. So we take off the top here and we just take out the small uh, rounds because I'm not making a small cheese right now. I'm making a big one. So I have uh, our mold and I need cheesecloth. So we're going to put our cheesecloth in and I just try to make it even. I kind of put it down inside. We're going to put our press in a 9 by 13 pan. And the reason is it doesn't fit in any other size. Uh, but the whey will start running out and this contains it while I can keep it on the counter or move it around. So now I'm going to take the cheese. I'm going to use my hands. You can use a strainer. A lot of people say pour off. The instructions say pour off, which means you would take this and put it in a colander and you would pour the whey in and let the whey drain off. Um, right now with the way it stands, that has been sitting uh, and all the curd is knit together at the bottom. So it'll break apart a little bit, but I'll be able to get out in some big chunks and put it in my cheese press. So you'll see. I don't I don't have the ability or the space really to pour it off. I don't have a big enough colander and I don't have a big enough, um, I don't have a lot of pots to be pouring that much way back and forth. So for me, it's easier if I just reach in and take it 
Let's see if we can adjust you here. And I'm just going to take it with my hands and pick it up and put it in here. Makes a little bit of a mess, but that's okay. You can see it's a big chunk at the bottom. And I can take it out, let some of the whey drain, so I don't have as much to drain out later. I'll put it in the bottom of my form. And then I just adjust and I press the cheese down. And then I come and get some more. And since we only took a 210, like I said, it's not that uncomfortable to touch it. So. Let's see if we have any more. Sometimes there's just a few little pieces floating around. So I'll grab those. But pretty much got most of it out in those two big chunks. And I just press it down a little bit with my hand. Now the best thing to do is to press it while it's still warm because it will be more malleable than when it cools. So, so we want to press it, put the wood form over the top. We put on our, and then kind of have to adjust this. So we really, this is pretty pressed from last time. So I've pressed it, it's first press. Give it about, I don't know, just one to two minutes and I'll flip it and do it the other way. I'll do that maybe three or four times. Just flip it and repress it um, pretty gently. So you're trying to get an even um, press on both sides of the cheese so it gets all the way to the middle and it's all the same density all the way through. Some of the whey comes out the top into the top. I think it would help if this had holes in it, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so I might experiment with that, but I don't want to ruin this one. So I might have Brenda make me another one um, with holes in it to see if it does better. Because right now there's um, whey builds up in the top and I have to pour it off because it doesn't seep all the way down. So can we unscrew it? Probably the most tedious part of this is unscrewing these two lug nuts. <laughs> It's really soft right now, so just gotta be careful. Sometimes if I haven't pressed it enough during the first press, it's really, really soggy and it doesn't really, um, it's hard to flip because it's kind of soft. But I think I've done a pretty good job this time. And I just kind of try to ooh, rewrap a little bit um, and I try to keep all the wrap on top. And then best I can, slide it back in. It doesn't need to be exact. I do like to keep cheese on, cloth on it during the first couple presses. And then after that, I take it off. Um, mostly to just keep it even. And um, because when it's soft, taking it out of the press is a little harder. And like I said, can fall apart a little bit. So you got to be careful. So then we just do it again. So this last press that I'm doing, I've done this about four times now, so I've turned it over. Um, I went ahead and put it in without the cheesecloth. So I'm gonna tighten this pretty good and then I'm gonna leave it for maybe 10 to 20 minutes. I'll come back and check it and I'll just tighten it a little bit if it's loose and kind of do that. And then I'll do that for maybe an hour, like every 15, 20 minutes come and just tighten it. And then I'll flip it over and I'll, Tighten it once and take it right back off. Anyway, then you take the weight off of it, but I leave it in the form with the tamper on top, but without screwing down the weight part. I leave that overnight and just let it sit in the form overnight. And I'll be back to you tomorrow morning to show you what we do with it after it's set all night. Also, we have whey that came off of the cheese still in this pot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it outside on our table cause it's like refrigerator temperature out there overnight, but it's gonna slow ferment. It has a culture in it. It was not heated above 110 so the culture should survive. Um, and we're just gonna let it sit overnight. And then tomorrow, but we're gonna make ricotta out of it while we're finishing up our other cheese. 
So we'll see you tomorrow. Good morning. Now is the next day and I'm going to take my cheese out of its form and show you guys what it looks like. It's still a little wet. Um, and kind of sticks to the board here. Now we're gonna salt it. What I do is I take a plate <clears throat> and I put it on it. It's a tablespoon for every gallon of milk. I use two and a half gallons of milk, but this is what I do. I just rub salt on the outside of it, then I flip it. And I just take another big scoop of salt. What I'm using here is a Celtic sea salt. It is full of minerals. It is not table salt. It's not iodized table salt. That is not good for you. <laughs> and um, your body cannot absorb that iodine. And then I rub it around the edges. Sometimes I'll do this and kind of roll it in whatever salt has fallen on the plate. And you want to salt all the sides of it. So get a little more salt, sprinkle it down on there, get it to really soak in. What this is going to do is going to salt the cheese. We put no other salt in this. Now, certain cheeses, you will salt the curd before you press it. This, you salt this and let it sit. The salt does a couple of things. It salts the cheese as it soaks in, but it's drawing out any more moisture in this cheese. It's drawing out. What you'll find is um, there'll be, the whey will be drawn out and you want a plate with a lip to do this um, because it will sit in here and then you just pour it off every day. And that way, get all the whey out of it and, and then it will start drying and aging and forming that kind of rind on it and that's what you want. So, lots of salt. And I might come back as I flip it and it's wet in the bottom of the plate and I pour that off. I'll probably add another layer of salt later in the day. And we just flip it every, every, well, every time I think about it and it looks like it's wet, I'll just flip it and I'll do that and I'll pour the whey off the plate so it can dry out. And then after a day or so of doing that, I'll put it on, um, Brendan made me these wooden like cheese drying racks and I just put it on there and flip it and that way it can air dry all the way around it's okay that this is going to grow mold okay cheese it's what it does it grows mold this will also grow mold the great thing about it is you're now inoculating your next cheese with this mold so it's okay we're all scared of mold on cheese i've had a few trepidatious moments myself but it's okay it's supposed to grow there. You don't want like bright yellow or green mold, bright pink. A little bit of orange mold is okay. Green, blue, perfect. White, 100%. That's what you're looking for. So flip, flip. This is going to go washed in my cooler. And I'm going to show you some of my cheeses I've done over the last few weeks. We take the whey, just a little bit, this is about a pint of whey off of the cheese we just made, and actually this is from last week, and you put a tablespoon of salt in it. Then, after the cheese has been drying a few days, I take a piece of cheesecloth and I wipe down the cheese with this. It is cultured and salted. So it continues to salt it over and over again and it seeps in. Um, but mainly you're looking to create this kind of white bloom. It's essentially, it's not really mold, it's a, a certain culture. It has a long Latin name that I don't really know. This is a cheese I just pulled out of the cooler from last week. Um, sorry, two weeks ago. It's still drying. I do feel like I'm not getting all the way out because this is still pretty soft. It should be developing more of a rind on it. You can see where it's kind of darkening. That's drier, but I'm not flipping it as much when it's in the cooler. So see, you can see it's kind of getting a white rind there. Not as much as I had hoped before I vacuum sealed it, but my vacuum sealer, I broke the one I borrowed from a friend, so I have to buy a new one and uh, I'm getting it today. So 
hopefully I'll be able to vacuum seal this in the next couple days and I can develop more rind. So here's my salt brine and I just dip a piece of cheesecloth in and I just rub it over the top. And I know we're trying to dry these out, but we're also trying to create this mold layer, this um, cultured layer on the top. So I just dip it and I wipe it all over the whole thing. Try to get in some of the cracks. Kind of get them inoculated with this <clears throat> culture all over both sides. And that's it. So this one will go back in the cooler and it's two weeks old. So like I said, I'm hoping to vacuum seal it within the next week. And then here's the one we made last week. And I will do a brining of that one. And it's time for this one to go in the cooler and spend a week or two drying before I vacuum seal it. <laughs> 